Hello, everybody. From today onwards I will explain a horror anthology series called 50 States of Fright. Released in the year 2020, on the Quibi streaming platform. In this series, we take a look at 50 different urban legends, folk tales, and horror stories from the 50 states of America. The stories of each state are different and all its episodes are also independent. In the first three episodes, we see the horror story of Michigan State. This story is narrated by a guy called Andy Salt, who used to work for a craftsman named Dave. From his farm, Dave used to extract maple syrup from maple trees, and redwood from red oak trees. Dave's handmade furniture workshop was booming. Dave and his wife Heather were high school sweethearts. He loved Heather dearly as she was very beautiful. But to be fair she was pricey. She used to spend all of Dave's money on gold ornaments. She was obsessed with gold. One evening Dave and Heather were on their way to a dinner party, just then Andy missed his work for the day, hence Dave asked Heather to help. Dave was about to cut down an oak tree where Heather had to hold tight to the rope attached to the tree. Heather was holding the rope pretty hard, but a small piece of wood got stuck into the pulley of the rope, which caused it to rotate. When Dave finally severed the tree, the pulley, and the tree both rotated. The whole tree falls on Heather instead of falling the other way. Her hand gets crushed under the tree and she starts bleeding. Dave was in shock seeing all this, and with no other alternative available to stop bleeding, he chops off Heather's arm with an axe. After this incident, Heather went into depression as she felt she is not beautiful anymore. She started hating herself. Dave brought a prosthetic arm for her which she rejected by saying it's ugly. Hence Dave designed a beautiful prosthetic for her, which satisfied her to some extent. She insisted the material must be in gold as she loved it. Dave agreed despite his financial conditions. He took a mortgage on the house, sold his tractors, and made a golden arm. Finally, Heather's mental health improved. She started living happily, but a few months later, winter arrived where she fell sick. Doctors detected pulmonary gold disease in her. The gold from her golden arm was slowly poisoning her by leaching through her skin. It was terminal unless she stopped using it. Heather was adamant to live and die with it as she felt living a depressed life is no life at all. Dave tried to put some sense into her but she was addicted to that golden arm like an addict. She asked Dave to bury her with arm, she took a promise from him. In fact, she wanted to appear perfect even in death. Dave agreed and he buries Heather with her golden arm. Several months later the American economy goes into the Great Recession, ending the market for handmade furniture. The loan amount on the house made Dave financially broke. Troubled by Heather's death and financial conditions, Dave started drinking. Then one night he remembers Heather's golden arm in her grave. As a last resort, he started digging Heather's grave, he goes to get her arm but that arm does not come out of the body. He chops her hand with an axe, and just then Heather's dead eyes open as if giving him a warning. Dave in horror saw this and closed her eyes. With a little bit of struggle, he grabbed the golden arm. As soon as he started heading back Heather's eyes opened again. This time Dave was freaked out, he rushed to his house and closed the door. Paranormal activities started as he entered the house. The strong wind starts blowing outside. A photo of Heather falls in front of him where she was holding an axe. Different voices started resonating in the house and Heather's photo suddenly changes. A strong wind blows open the main door, and Heather's spirit returns to her dead body to take her golden arm. Dave runs away seeing all this and hides in his room. Where Heather calls out where is my golden arm? You said you would always keep it with me. Dave's bed started trembling, he was hiding under a bed sheet and in horror. He returned Heather her golden arm. Heather leaves as soon as she finds the golden arm. When Dave took off his cover, Heather's ghost suddenly attacks him with an axe and slits his throat. We then see Heather's body along with Dave's on the same bed. In the end, Andy says according to the official records of the police, no one knew who killed Dave. Or how Heather's body got there. But everyone in town believed it to be Heather's ghost. After this event, we buried Heather's body along with her golden arm as she wished. Everyone knows about the golden arm and where it is located but no one dares to take it. 
with this Michigan State story ends. Over the next three episodes, we look at the story of Kansas State. The sheriff of a small town was telling this story to a reporter. This story follows a mother Susan and her daughter Amelia on a road trip. Amelia was close to her dad who died recently. Susan wanted to move forward in life with her but Amelia was keeping her distance from her. Susan sees a roadside billboard advertising the world's largest ball of twine. She diverts the car to the town to cheer Amelia up. As these two entered the town they faced racism, a man asked them where they are from in a rude way. As he thought they do not look like Americans. Later, the town's sheriff welcomes Susan and she begins to chat. Meanwhile, Amelia goes to watch the ball of twine alone. Originally this ball of twine was started by a man named Greg Kakar in 1954. It took 20 years to build, it weighed 20,000 pounds, and was 14 feet tall. Mr. Kakar built it in memory of his two children. Amelia was reading all this history, when she heard the voices of many children from the ball. She puts her ear to the twine in curiosity to listen, where we see a hand behind her. Later many hands like that grabbed Amelia inside the ball. Later Susan came to the twine ballroom looking for Amelia but she was nowhere to be found. She found only her earphones. Susan panics and started searching for her. She asked everyone in the town but nobody knew anything. Finally, she asked the sheriff to organize a search party. Sheriff Stallings took the matter lightly. She declines the search party request and tells Susan to wait in the office. She goes out and discusses something with the other officers. Susan understood something is not right, she overheard Sheriff Stallings's discussion. When Sheriff Stallings returned, the two officers grabbed Susan and the sheriff spit out a small ball of twine from her mouth. The twine was beating like a heart. She tells Susan that Amelia isn't just yours anymore, she's changed. If you want to see her you'll have to change too. Sheriff Stallings forcefully feeds Susan that twine, soon Susan starts to choke on it, she falls to the ground. Yet she managed an attack, she hit the sheriff in the face. Instead of blood pouring from her face, a twine comes out. Susan quickly ran from here and removed that twine from her mouth. Susan attacks other officers as well from whom too the twine started coming out. Meaning all these people were not humans, these were some type of functional zombies made up of twines. Susan chops Sheriff Stallings with an axe and finally, Sheriff Stallings reveals why they are doing this. She says the kids are alone in the twine, they need kids to play with them. Susan understood where Amelia was. She was in the same ball of twine. As she rushed out rest of the zombies of the town were already standing outside. They attacked Susan and she fought back. She somehow reached the ball of the twine room. This time she too heard the voices of many children who were trapped inside. She began tearing down the twine and finally saw Amelia who was unconscious. Next to her were two more bodies that were originally Mr. Kafka's children. This bundle of twine was their grave. Susan begins to take Amelia out when the twine begins to seal itself again. Amelia regains consciousness, clings to Susan and says you came to pick me up. Finally, she accepts her mom as a mom. Now the ball of twine seals all by itself and seeing which Susan accepts her fate. Outside the sheriff now says there is nothing to fear, more people will come. A few days later, a reporter comes to the sheriff's office to cover the news of missing Susan and Amelia. Here the sheriff tells another story. She says, Susan and Amelia came to see the ball of twine, where Amelia was momentarily lost, and everyone in town searched for her. We found her near the ball. After this, they left for the city. Basically, sheriff lied to the reporter. This is where the story ends. Let me tell you, in reality, the world's largest ball of twine is in Kansas State's Cocker City. It is 49 feet wide and weighs 200,000 pounds. It is a tourist attraction. Hope you enjoy the short stories. In the next video, I will explain the story of Oregon and Minnesota State. If you like the video then please give a like. If you are new to the channel then do subscribe and comment. Thanks for watching, take care.